Namaste. Thank you for making 2018 the greatest year for Infinity Foundation. I will show you some of the highlights of what we did this year. The British House of Parliament invited me to give a special lecture in the House of Parliament. I explained to them the importance of thanking India and the Indian soldiers who fought for Britain in World War I and World War II. Watch this. In World War I, 1.3 million Indian soldiers fought on the side of the Allies. Yeah. More than the combined number of soldiers from all other countries put together. And there is no memorial to them in Britain. The same sort of statistics also for World War II. Now, what a great soft power move it would be for the British government to say, let's work together and let's produce a real solid monument. It's not out of blame, anger, guilt, or any of that stuff, but just to honor those people. 75,000 Indian soldiers died in World War I fighting on the British side, and another 70,000 were seriously injured. This is a very high casualty. And let me also tell you this, many military historians feel that if it weren't for such a large number of brave Indians, Britain would probably have lost the war. And Britain would probably have, this means, turned out to ended up as a German colony. And today we would be sitting here speaking German. So this is pretty serious stuff. That, that a huge event, twice in the, in the 20th century, we, our community did. Our ancestors did this. Uh, most of them Hindus. We did this. And there ought to be, at least for emotional, psychological reasons, there ought to be a nice memorial somewhere. So this is, this is another kind of an example of what I'm talking about. Very concrete, soft power reparations. I believe that next year, April 19th, 2019, will be the 100th anniversary of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. That was a huge massacre that General Dyer ordered a peaceful gathering <laughs> in Amritsar, and a large number of people were brutally killed, fired. What we also need to be ashamed of is that the actual bullets were fired by Indian sepoys. Mm -hmm. Indian sepoys killed their fellow Indians in very large numbers throughout the British time. And this Jallianwala Bagh is not just a disgrace for one man, General Dyer, but also for all the Indians who sold out to do this dirty work. And we generally don't complain about these sepoys, but we should, because the modern intellectuals who are colonized, who are bringing the same kind of uh, anti-Indian grand narrative are basically sepoys 2.0. That's who they are. They are the breaking India forces. So this, this business, so what, what could we do? So something positive could be done. We should have a conference or we should have something to uh, kind of uh, um, memorialize what happened 100 years ago. Uh, you know, in Germany, they teach a Holocaust and they teach it with a kind of not that, uh, you know, somebody's fault. It's like it happened. We don't take ownership of it. Something in the past happened. It won't happen again. Let's move on. In the United States, there's a lot of uh, white, black reconciliation where uh, they teach slavery. It happened in a previous generation. It was a horrible thing to happen and we've now made sure it won't happen again. So having set the record, let's not have this under the current, undercurrents of anger and hatred and all that. Let's move on, let's just move on together. I think it's time that the Indians got out of this old negativity towards the British. It's time that the British acknowledged what has happened. It's time that we worked together and that is what I'm calling soft power reparations. And the benefit will be we will move forward in a win-win way positively as collaborators. That's what I would like to happen. The following clip is from one of the three parts I did with S. Gurumurthy, the famous economist, on the rise and fall of Western development models. Western polity originally rested on the divine right theory, hmm. where the king is supposed to be the very uh, 
mirror reflection of god right and so god had the world uh, dedicated to him and the king had the uh, rule over people resources everything dedicated to him like in the bible mm. everything belongs to god here on the earth everything belong to the king so he's a representative of god in a sense. representative mirror reflection of god so he had the divine right to do everything in this three things flew out one the king can do no wrong principle mm. two that everything belongs to the king mm. and so he has only given you the right to temporary use you can use it mm. but if he wants he can resume it back mm. this is called the principle of eminent domain mm. in constitutional law mm. the third thing is he had control over your life also only if he uh, he has given you the lease of life mm. but if he wants he can take the life back these three principles mm. inform the constitutional law even today mm. so much so during the emergency in india mm. when nirende argued that during the emergency there is no fundamental right to live oh boy wow yes when the judges asked he said all fundamental rights are suspended because 14 high courts decided that the habeas corpus petition should be admitted because suddenly a man has disappeared from your family the wife or the son says go on the state has to find out so they allowed the habeas corpus petition the supreme court the matter went to the supreme court so it is a right to life then the judges asked do you there is no right to life mm. during emergency he said it may shock your conscience my lords if a police inspector takes a pistol and shoots down somebody your lordships have no other remedy than to look at it my god this rests on this principle yes you know prior to the british arrival in india the principle of eminent domain was not applicable because the king had no right to take over others property it is in magna carta this was modified and you can pay, pay the compensation and take the property mm. but in india by paying compensation also you cannot take over another person's property this was the position that is why they had to enact the land acquisition act in india before mm. that kings could not take over with people's land mm. compulsorily they had to go through the panchayat and actually buy the land mm. this is settled privy council has said in india the king had no right to acquire the property compulsorily the question of right to life was a divine right mm. and so there was no question of anybody taking away your right to life so these are two different paradigms yes 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 very clear and very well stated very clearly stated so this constitutional paradigm and economic paradigm aligned and rested on the individual so how the democratic movement changed the divine right theory into what is known as social contract theory by hobbes hmm. hobbes said we are basically an anarchic kind of people we cannot live together we will only kill each other so we need a leviathan state hmm. to make us behave and so the state has all the powers all the rights so he secularized the divine right theory hmm. into state into state yeah only one modification was brought about by lok he said that has to be an elected state hmm. once you elect the state the state has the same power hmm. it can declare emergency it can acquire our property it can so the character of the state did not change hmm. it is only that the people give consent every 5 years to the state to do the thing which a divine right king could do mm. so this is one paradigm but in india this was not there so after the emergency because the king had to obey the king had to absolutely. follow his dharma absolutely yeah, because no one was absolute yes 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 so in india the following our way of looking at things after the emergency the government uh said that the uh that the state has no right to touch the life of an individual i was invited by the prestigious radha krishnan memorial lecture to deliver this year's lecture i spoke on my forthcoming book on the indian grand narrative here's a clip explaining why such a narrative is very important 
why do we need a grand narrative? You see, individuals have a narrative of who I am. Family has a narrative about itself. There are corporate narratives about, you know, what, what is special about this corporate entity, its values, what's distinct about its brand. Uh, so a community, a common of, uh, a community needs a common purpose to exist together at, from the level of a family to all the way up, you know. And when you look at, uh, when you look at different countries that are successful, uh, it's very clear that the grand narrative is a part of nation building. Uh, Americans have an official name for their grand narrative. It's called American exceptionalism, which means Americans are the exceptional people of the world. And later I'll ask, is there such a thing as Bharatiya exceptionalism? I'll ask that question. Very often I get attacked for merely asking that question by Indians. No non-Indian has attacked me. But the Indians are invariably there attacking me. Just to give you an example, uh, around uh, long, many, long back there was a governor of the state of New Jersey who was very India friendly. So he created an Asian study, Asian commission. There was an uh, African commission because the African community wanted uh, many things and they wanted representation. And then there was a Hispanic commission like that. So he, were, he, wanted, he created an Asian commission and brought uh, one one commissioner from each country like China, this, that. I was the India representative, Indian commissioner. And so then they appointed me to be the chairman of Asian studies. They said we should introduce Asian studies into schools and colleges because Asia is the future. I, I actually made a, pay, a case like that in the year 2000. It was before this big rise of India, China. This is like when, you know, these things were still like futuristic ideas. So I made a case that the next generation Americans need to understand Asia. Like today, the curriculum is all about Europe because the heritage is European. But the uh, engaging with Asia will be important. So we started this project to uh, come up with this Asian studies curriculum. And in the meetings, I found that whenever I would talk about all these kind of things about, you know, Asia's contributions to the world and the Asian narrative and all that, whenever I would say something for, favorable for India, there were one or two Indians who would get very upset, very upset. So why, why don't you talk about the women they burnt a, a month ago? Or why don't you put that in? Why don't you put this caste thing here, there? So they were the typical sort of fellows who were very embarrassed about a positive narrative. So what I did is, I called the Chinese guy, the Japanese guy, the Malaysian fellow, the lady from Myanmar, Vietnam, I called these people to my house for a private discussion without these two Indians. And I went around and said, okay, what do you think of this idea? And they all liked it. They said, you have to have a, we have to have a positive narrative. So this, I, I had two, two or three big things, you know. I had one, one was the expansion of Buddhism all over Asia is a part of the Asian narrative. And they loved it. Like that, I had some things. So I then went to the next meeting of our a committee and I had made this uh, agreement, this understanding that uh, these other fellows from Asia, different other countries, they'll talk. So I just said I, uh, I want to start this meeting and I want to invite comments. So I'll go from this side and the Chinese guy spoke very positively about what I was saying that this Buddhist expansion and uh, the spread of all over Asia is very positive and other contributions we've made. The Europeans are always talking about the greatness of their civilization and we should talk about ours. Japanese, the Vietnamese, they all supported me. And luckily for me, after that event, these two fellows disappeared. They left the whole commission. So this has been my experience for a very long time. So don't tell me, because I have lived this. It is not we, we have serious problems among our own uh, people. Now, grand narrative includes true facts of history, fantasy, exaggeration, wishful thinking. It's a narrative of all that. It's like when you have a brand of a company, it's not, they don't tell you that uh, drink Coke and it consists of gas and caffeine and color and uh, will kill you with uh, uh, diabetes. It is not like that. Uh, this is part of promoting oneself in this world which is competitive. So there is nothing ashamed about the fact that people's grand narratives are a positive projection. There is a positive reason for why we are together as a nation and this ought to be celebrated. There is nothing embarrassing about it. Uh, 
So now the American exceptionalism is a very interesting idea, which, uh, which spans the left and the right. You see, it's very, you may think that only some right-wing uh, chauvinists will be like that. Uh, but you know, you look at uh, very liberal left-wing, um, by American standards, liberal left-wing, okay? Uh, which is, to be leftist in America is not the same thing like in India, you know? Uh, they are very patriotic. The American exceptionalism is a part of uh, all the uh, liberals, the Democrats, the Republicans. Uh, it is like a common thing that everybody uh, subscribes to. Every American president, before he gets elected, has to go around showing he is a good Christian. Barack Obama, you would say, okay, he's the most liberal left-wing guy. Uh, he announced his presidential candidacy that I'm going to run for, and the, on the front of his church. It's like a CPM leader announcing his uh, uh, candidacy for the election, uh, standing in front of Billa Mandir and saying, uh, this is who I am. It would be equivalent to that, because this is a very left-wing president. But he has to say this. And the other common denominator is they have to be very, very pro-military. That I, either I have fought in the military or if I didn't fight, I, you know, I'm one of them. The, the patriotism is very strong and you'll find this true everywhere. But we have a problem. We really in India have a problem on this. China has a, a goal. Uh, they have several hundred Confucian institutes they will have which are promoting the Chinese grand narrative worldwide. And the goal is in two years they'll have a thousand. They'll reach a thousand. And when they set a goal like that, they have achieved these kind of goals. So now it's like seven, eight hundred, you know. Uh, and so their grand narrative starts with Confucian, Taoism, Buddhism, they acknowledge. They, they, uh, when they became modern, uh, they're very clear in saying uh, our modernization is not westernization. We have a Chinese modernity. Like there is a western modernity, there is a Chinese modernity. They go on and on talking about it. Whereas in India, we have this confusion that you have modern, then leave tradition. If you are traditional, then you are modern. We do not, we are really confused. Actually, if you think about it in our civilization, traditional, modern and postmodern are all coexisting without a conflict. We don't have a linear chronology which says that you kill one, destroy the books, supersede it with the next stage, and then kill that and fight and destroy it and then come up with the next stage. So we do not have discontinuity in the transitions. We have these things flowing together. So to, to say that you should be modern, therefore you have to reject tradition is a very kind of a wrong idea for us. But that is how, how the reality is. Dr. Subramaniam Swami held a special event for me in Mumbai to speak about my forthcoming book on the Indian Grand Narrative. I discussed the chapter on Swadeshi Muslims, which deals with how and why it's important for Muslims to be part of the Indian story. Now I will turn to the controversial chapter I want to talk about. I have a certain amount of minutes left and I want to focus on this one chapter. It will be one of maybe a dozen chapters altogether. The chapter has, deals with where are, what is the place for Indian Muslims in our grand narrative? And you can see this is a very hot topic. You know, dhyan se bolna pe, right. So I, I started conducting some interviews in Delhi with Muslims, young, broad-minded, educated Muslims. And Many of them are involved in this triple talaq, you know, fighting triple talaq and, and all this uh, polygamy and things like that. And I started asking them questions about everything controversial even. And I have videotapes them. I put them on videotape. I'm going to edit, put them out on public and they're willing. So I found to my surprise, there are substantial number of Muslims who've had it with orthodox Islam and who feel that the vast majority of Indian Muslims are not well-educated people and they are therefore driven by whatever the Imam says. And the Imam is looking for his own power structure. And these more educated, professional type Muslims don't like it. They, are, they have fear, some of them, 
and so there is kind of not necessarily an organized approach. So there is also a leadership issue. They need some encouragement. They need some, in, some organizational help. So I figured this is a, this is a fruitful uh, enterprise, fruitful area of my investigation as part of my grand narrative. Because imagine if I wrote a book called The Indian Grand Narrative and there's nothing about Mus Muslims, except that they've destroyed some things, you know, a thousand years ago they destroyed, which they did, and my book is very clear, very strong on all the Muslim destruction. But the question still remains, what about today? What do we do today? So, I don't accept the voice, which, the Muslim voice which says reject Islam, so the Tariq Fateh type. Because if you reject Islam, maybe a few people will go along with that, but the majority of Muslims are not going to just say, okay, we reject Islam. And the Ghar Wapsi is going to be fine for some people. I think it's not a practical idea that you'll do Ghar Wapsi of the whole lot of such people. I don't think that's going to work. So these are fine, they're okay. I mean, there should be internal criticism in every religion. So some people are anti-Islam from within, that's fine, that's their choice. And some people may want to do Ghar Wapsi, that's also their choice. But I wanted to find out, is there a narrative where the person is a proud Muslim, but he is, before that, first and, first and foremost, he's a proud Bharatiya. And I wanted to investigate that. So I have a name for it. And I have a domain name also. And there's going to be a chapter with that name. And this is, I'm calling such people, Swadeshi Muslims. That's my term. Now people ask, why not Indian? And I said, because, you know, when you say Indian, to Behas Parthiya, was India 70 years old? British make it? Was it Hindustan? So, you know, I don't want a diversion. People like to divert and our people then go into arguing that. Swadeshi Muslims has no, uh, no, no kind of ambiguity in what it means. Swadesh, this is my desh. So if I, if I were to say, are you an Indian Muslim proud? He'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you go deep into it, he's only talking in a certain camouflaged way. He's not really what I, I'm looking for. But when I say, is this your Swadesh? Matri Bhumi, Pitri Bhumi, this is it. Which means, and I define very clearly, that your ancestors are from here. They didn't come from the Middle East. So when we talk about decolonizing, getting rid of the British influence, then also decolon decolonizing, the de-Arabizing is something you ought to do because Islam, if you claim Islam is a universal faith that Allah has brought to everybody on, in, the, in the world, then Arab customs, dress, names, habits are not necessarily going to supersede the Indian customs and culture, you can still be a Muslim. So I challenge this and I have this on videotape and when I go back uh, to Delhi tonight, Tuesday I have another meeting with this group. So every time I'm telling them, go bring, bring a few more friends and we'll see how far it'll go. But I think it will become an interesting movement. So I, I've even said things like, uh, uh, the Swadeshi Muslim it has to claim our heroes, the heroes of the soil, rather than the invaders as the heroes. So the, maybe the invaders were of your religion and uh, your ancestors were natives, Swadeshis, who lost and you, you became, uh, you now adopt the religion of the, of the invaders and I'm not asking you to convert. I'm not asking you to do any of that. You can remain that. But can you be a Muslim without being Arabized or Persianized or Turkish? Can you be a Bharatiya style Muslim? And this is a very interesting thing. I tell them that my experience in Indonesia has been very helpful because in Indonesia, they say their language is Bhasha. They write in the English alphabet, but they're writing Bhasha. And when I ask them, who are you? We're Muslims. So why, what is this Bhasha thing? And so they're, they're saying that our ancestors came from India. They're saying that our, our civilization came from India. Our tradition places a lot of importance on debates and arguments among experts. Nityanand Mishra is a Sanskrit scholar who has studied the works of Devdat Patnaik. I had an interview with him in which he went point by point 
and gave a rebuttal to some of the important interpretations of Devdutt Patnaik. Watch this and go and watch the entire series, please. Here's an interesting chart you have done. The different issues that you raise, I think it's important to tell the audience before we go into the details of what are the five or six major kind of things that you find wrong with him and then we'll go into more detail. Sure. So specifically, uh, and this is again based on uh, a, a good reading, an in-depth reading of his book, The Mai Gita, mm. My Hanuman Chalisa, and uh, some of his articles on the net, uh, some of his uh, tweets as well. So uh, what I find is, there are serious issues in the works of Devdutt Patnaik. First and foremost, he calls himself an expert on Puranas and Itihasas. He's considered, you know, uh, by the layperson, he's considered the ultimate authority. In fact, recently when there was this uh, controversy on uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar's remark on uh, homosexuality, uh, a Bollywood actress, Sonam Kapoor, tweeted saying, to get to know more about Hinduism, read Devdutt Patnaik. <laughs> and, and Sonam Kapoor is not uh, nobody. She has got, I think, 12 million followers on, the Twitter, on, on Twitter. So a person who's widely considered an authority on Hinduism or Puranas, he narrates things which are so inaccurate from the Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Puran or uh, uh, you know, other Itihasas and Shastras, which I find very surprising, at least you know, we, we, say, we say to know your stuff. That's a, if, if I'm a doctor, I should know medical field. If I'm a statistician, I should at least know the ABCs of statistics. If, I'm, uh, if I style myself as a mythologist, or if I style myself as an expert from Puranas, I should have at least read the original Puranas, and I should be at least knowledgeable about them, which I find lacking. So that is one of the major issues, that you have a person who is considered an authority on a subject matter, and he's not. That, to me, is a big issue. Uh, then, uh, now he's, he's not only a storyteller, he, he's now writing on the Gita, on Hanuman Chalisa, and he, in some articles he writes about uh, you know, origins of Sanskrit, on the Aryan invasion theory, and all, all sorts of stuff. So, what I find so is... So, it's dangerous, because his field is so vast, yes. so much credibility, and he's funded by some big corporate people. I would guess... There so. was the Future Group. He was the chief belief officer or something? Of the, the future group, group a yeah. multinational conglomerate uh, in Mumbai. And I think now Reliance supports him, is what they say. Somebody, somebody supports him, some big people support him. Because obviously he has the ability to go and convince people that he he's popularizing Hinduism. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. So when he comes to <coughs> things which are outside the, the story narration part, when he comes to philosophy, like the Gita, there is wild imagination. Imagination running wild. His so imagination. His imagination running wild. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, he explains philosophical terms which have no, in a way, which have <coughs> no connection whatsoever to how they are understood in our, in our shastras or in, in our tradition. So he'll invent concepts, he will invent new, new concepts and, and misattribute them to the Gita or to Hanuman Chalisa or specific terms in Sanskrit and then say, okay, this is my interpretation. So uh, that is to me is a very serious issue. Well, you can, you can say it is my imagination, but you cannot say it's nonfiction. You can't say it's nonfiction and philosophy and then you, you then bring in your own imagination and uh, you say this is what the Gita says. That's yeah, it would be okay if he said, I'm just telling you fiction yeah. and I'm using some of the same names and characters, but I'm writing fiction. So it's not knowledge. It's not philosophy, it's not Shastra. Don't uh, take it as authoritative understanding of our Shastra. That would be different. Which but is he, why he, yeah, but he's saying that I am telling you what the real tradition is. Yeah, which is why I find Amish Tripathi is at least honest in the sense he says his books are fiction. Yeah. Yeah. So here we have Amish Tripathi who clearly says whatever I publish is fiction, it's a retelling. But that's not the case with Hedat Patak. His, uh, his uh, book, My Gita, is non fiction philosophy. That's how Rupa presents it. So, yeah. uh, another issue, major issue with his work is somehow he has this obsession with force fitting themes of sex, violence, and LGBTQ uh, aspects into our works, into Shastras, into even art. So, you know, if he sees two gopis together, he'll say they're lesbians. Right. And that, that to me is like uh, an anti Brahmin all the way through. All the way through. And anti-NRIs. Anti-NRIs. Yeah. Although his money comes, he go, went on a fundraising to US, so he, he's happy to take the money. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. 
The Shastras of our tradition comprise the largest library of ancient texts of any civilization in the world. In this lecture at a very prestigious location, I explain the importance of Shastras as a part of our grand narrative. Please watch this. Shastra is important as basis for our discovering our narratives because Without the Shastras, we would be no better than pagans, we would be finished off. Because also, there is a huge attack on the Shastras from the postmodernist people. One very well known lady, good friend of mine, her comment was Marxism katam ho gaya hai. Uska, uske baare mein purv paksh karne ka fayde nahi. Marxist log chale gaye. Now this is a very, I, I thought this is very strange. I emailed back and forth and she confirmed that Marxist ki power chali gayi, unki funding ja rahi hai, unko nikala ja raha hai. What she doesn't understand, Marxism has evolved into postmodernism. So wo usne bhej badal diya, uska naya avatar a gaya hai. It is not Marxism is dead, Marxism is more sophisticated. Marxism comes in a way that will you will like it also. Because it will say Sanskrit both beautiful language, a kavya both beautiful language, second breaking batmat karo, usme kuch or meaning nikalo. So now the latest uh, pale after the Marxists came to India in all these leftist universities, they were they wanted to throw out Sanskrit. And in United States also the leftists wanted to throw out Sanskrit. Now they are bringing their distorted version of Sanskrit. In Columbia University, they have a program for, uh, it's called Ambedkar Stud Sanskrit Studies. Oh, now you, why is it Ambedkar? It is, uh, Ambedkar because they want to bring certain people. So JNU, English department ke, they are not uh, Sanskrit department. English department ke, history department ke, istra ke, Delhi University se, ye sari universities ke jo aise log aate hain, unko ek do saal mein, फटाफट ये अपने आइडिया ऑफ संस्कृत करके उनको इंडिया में भेज देते हैं टू क्रिएट प्रॉब्लम्स सो देर इज अ न्यू ब्रिगेड ऑफ संस्कृत सेमी एजुकेटेड नॉट वेल एजुकेटेड बट संस्कृत सेमी एजुकेटेड लेफ्ट विंग पीपल हु आर ऑल ओवर द प्लेस लाइक अनन्या वाजपेई इज अ प्रोडक्ट लाइक दैट देर आर मेनी पीपल लाइक दैट सो आई डिसग्रीड विद दिस व्यू विच वॉज presented to the minister ke bhi ye to left wing ko criticize karne ka fayda hi nahi to we don't care because wo to khatam hogi baat it is not khatam hogi you have to if you are concerned about the future of sanskriti you have to be very concerned about the future of shastra that is my point our narrative is based on that and then if you are concerned about the future of shastra you have to really understand postmodernism and how postmodernism feminism ki tarah cha aa gaya minority studies subaltern studies in mein saro mein uh, marxist view aa gaya and they are looking at ramayan they looking at uh, all kind of things all our different shastra and break it, coming up with very different kind of interpretations so this is why i am uh, actually if you look at it Rather than just being one chapter of my book, this can be like a huge thing by itself. It's a major point. Hai. But I also want to make my book simple enough for a lot of people to read. So, thank you. Dhaniwad. 2018 was certainly a tremendous year for Infinity Foundation. 2019 will be an even more exciting year because a lot of my new books will be released. Thank you for your support. Let's stay in touch and keep the dialogue going.